<laughs> right on. Welcome, everyone. Let's introduce Childish Japes to Dromeo along with J.P. Bouvet. Thanks for coming out, guys. Our pleasure. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's thanks wicked. For having us. So let me introduce the whole band right to the very far end there. We have Asher. Asher is a guitarist, obviously, as you can see. <laughs> <laughs> and right beside him, we have Jed on bass. And then J.P. Bouvet. JP, you are probably one of our most requested drummers to come on Drumio, so I'm very thankful that you can uh, find the time to come out here and grace us with your presence here. Well, it's an honor. Yeah. And today's a really cool lesson. This is the first time we've actually brought in a full band for a live lesson like this. And what a better topic than creative tools for writing in a band. We're going to bring a whole band out and talk about that with you guys all here. So thank you so much. Of course. Now, if you guys haven't seen J.P. Bouvet before, you can check him out online. He is uh, live on his own website, which is jpbouvetmusic.com, I believe. That's correct. And also his Instagram, which is just at J.P. Bouvet. So make sure you follow him there. And if you guys like what you just heard with Childish Japes, find them online. Basically, anywhere that there's online presence for bands, right? Yeah. You, you won't find another, a lot of other Japes out there. Yeah. <laughs> Childish Japes. That's yeah. J-A-P-E-S. That's right. And you guys just released an album couple weeks back, right? Yep, it's called After You're Born. Awesome. You can find that iTunes and everywhere else. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Uh, so we're going to get into the lesson very soon. Just uh, one second to quickly thank all the sponsors for helping make this happen. DW, Remo, Meinl, Vic for Sticks as well. Am I missing anyone? Nope. I don't think so. And for all you guys watching us live, welcome. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, if you do have questions, submit them below. We might not get to uh, all of them or many of them, depending on how long this goes. Uh, but we are doing a very cool performance slash interview with the whole band tomorrow, which will be live as well. Um, so if we don't get to them t today, we can get to them tomorrow. So that being said, creative tools, or for, yeah, creative tools for writing in a band. Take it away. Right Jay. on. Yeah. All right. So creative tools for writing with a band. This, uh, the reason that we particularly were very excited about this topic on Dromeo is that this band is a very collaborative musical entity. Um, of the, if you listen to the first album, actually all of the tracks on that album were spawned from jams, either me and Asher, me and Jed, or the three of us together. And then, you know, we had this great chemistry as we were starting to play together, and we were thinking like, oh, maybe we should make a band out of this and, and make it real. <clears throat> so all those are born from jams and us just improvising and creating in the moment, or, or being inspired by something we heard recently. And although jamming has this sort of like laid back, like anything goes kind of uh, who knows what's gonna happen uh, vibe that goes along with it, there is a lot more intent that can be put into the writing process and the jamming process and the creating process in general that will make those sessions more fruitful. Um, and that's really the goal uh, of this next hour is to hopefully give you guys some fuel, whether you play in a band or not, actually just give you guys some fuel to, uh, to expand your creativity and, and just get you thinking in maybe a different way to, to bring some new ideas into the picture. So that's what we're dealing with. There's one uh, mental image I want to plant here in the beginning of the lesson that I'm going to refer back to several times. And I call it the web of intent. Now, the web of intent, you have to just use your imagination here. In the middle is something I call the gray area. The gray area is not particularly anything. It's not too loud, too soft, too fast, too slow, too busy, too empty. It's kind of like what you accidentally do when you start playing the drums. It's, it's fairly uninspired. And it's a dangerous area because if you stay there too long, things get very old very quickly. And it's just not sort of remarkable in any way. So now, that's the center of our, our web here. And I want you to imagine an arrow going out this way and an opposite arrow going the other direction. And at the edge, at the end of those arrows, are two opposite adjectives of your choosing, right? The easiest one here, fast, slow. You can imagine this way, loud, soft. You can imagine this way, busy, empty. Another example could be uh, all the instruments playing, one instrument playing. And this works for anything, right? One that I, I hope we explore, I hope we have time to explore in this masterclass would be evil and, and uh, what's the opposite of evil? Good. Angelic. Good, yeah, evil and good, right? <laughs> that would inspire different musical ideas. So in this case, what we're thinking is, okay, we're getting together to play. We want to be creative. Maybe we have an idea, maybe we don't. But wherever we start, 
will probably eventually become the gray area. So you want to be moving these ideas in some direction or another. And that kind of imagery really helps me, not only in the, in the performance space, but in the practice room, to think, what could I do with this idea to make it more interesting? And coincidentally, you'll probably find, as you do that, some things that you could also go practice. Right? If you're taking a groove and you think, I want to make this busier, you're going to hit a wall at some point. And that's where you find the things that you could practice next. So the web of intent we'll come back with, but that's, that's uh, yeah, this overarching idea there. And the first specific tool we want to deal with here is subtraction. So this was the first thing that came to mind when Dave and I were talking about this topic for, for Dromeo. Because uh, there's a very specific concert I remember watching. Of, uh, it was just a random band from Finland that was playing at this little club in New York. And it was like a pop synth band. And I remember watching an entire 45-minute set and just being exhausted by the end. And I realized at the end that all I wanted the whole time was for one person to stop playing. Because synth is really in your face and it's constant. So you've got a synth player, a synth bass player, a drummer, and a singer who's also playing a synth. And if they're all playing all the time, it's just way too much. So the easiest thing you can do to make an impact is subtract something. So in this case, a simple example on the drums, without, without even the band, is, is this. take one thing out and it makes a pretty big difference. So a couple different types of subtraction that we can do here and we'll demonstrate with the band. The first one is just removing an instrument, plain and simple. Like, okay, no drums in the pre-chorus, done. The other type would be subtracting a frequency range, right? So saying between the three of us, no low notes in this section or no high notes. And that's going to affect what they play and or who plays at all. And it's going to affect, for me, what instruments I play here. Because the cool thing about the drum set is we kind of have the lowest and highest things in the musical spectrum here. So we, but, but that gives us a lot of responsibility to affect the music in a certain way. So let's first, let's look at subtracting an instrument. All right, so let's, let's get into a groove, a fairly repetitive one, and then Asher, you drop out. <laughs> like throwing the dart here. <laughs> so yeah, actually, let's, let's improvise a song. A, B, A. A, B, C. And the B section, Asher's out. Cool. 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 Ready? Mm. So two things happened there, right? Um, when Asher first dropped out, I kind of kept playing the same thing, Jed kind of kept playing the same thing, but this space was created. So you can imagine that if there's a vocalist, or if there's another instrument playing a more melodic line, that would be a moment for them to 
step up what they're doing and take more space. So that's one thing that happens, right? There's a, there's a change in dynamic there of the overall band. But the other thing that's really cool is that when Asher comes back in, there's a huge impact. So Asher playing all that time and then changing his part is cool and impactful. But Asher playing and then dropping out and coming in from nothing into a part that you haven't heard before is that much more impactful. So that was really cool. Um, and then we could say, let's try the other version where we, we subtract like the low end. Do we do this in like After You're Born? Kind of. Kind of. Yeah, for the second verse. Yeah, okay. Let's, let's try the After You're Born groove and then Jed and I subtract the low end. So I don't know if that means either Jed's gonna have to play higher or Jed's gonna have to drop out. And then I'm gonna have to affect what I'm doing here as well. Just the verse. Cool, let's hear it. Cool. Just stay this up. is a song from the album that just came out. One, two, one, two, three. So, I subtract the kick drum, I avoid toms, I keep it very clickly, clicky and high notey, and Jed's adjusting what he's doing to some higher notes, or dropping out altogether, and, and that's just another tool to sort of subtract hmm. a piece of the, the frequency range there. Very cool. So that's number one. Tool number one, subtract. Tool number one. Tool number two, match, right? So, matching. Like a cool example, I mean, this is in its simplest form, who matches with who, and what piece of the kit matches with what they're doing, or even what piece of what they're doing. Um, it's fairly, it's it might be overly common for us to think, okay, kick drum has to play what the bass is playing, and that's all. So, it's not necessarily the case. And Asher came in one day to rehearsal when we were jamming and writing last year with a really cool idea, and he was like, okay, uh, I want your hi-hat to match what I'm doing but I want the rest of your kit to either match what Jed's doing or just be playing a groove that's not related. And this already, this, once you start shifting these, uh, like who's matching with who things, this leads you into starting to break some of the, the groove rules, if you will, which we talk about in the course that we did on Drumio. But um, you'll see what I mean here. So, Space Jam? Space Jam. So Michael Jordan. <laughs> so Asher came in with, with this line. And now the only thing that's important here, it's in four. He's playing a thing that repeats every three bars, but count four four. It'll be a lot cooler if you do. And it'll make a lot more sense once Jed comes in. But so Asher came in with this line.
so that, it was such a simple idea, but it created such a unique groove. Like we're going between two chords, going between two chords, two chords, and I, he's playing one rhythm the whole time. And then all that happens is they change roles, which is something we'll talk about in a few minutes. But And register. Yeah, and register. And so Jed starts playing do 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 And instead of Jed holding down the chords and the moving notes, Asher's doing that. So, yeah, who's matching with who uh, is, is, is not just which, which, like, are you matching with the bass player or the guitar player. But you can divide up your kit to start thinking, okay, do I like does my do my hands match one member and does my kick match the other? Hmm. And then it's important to realize you don't have to match anyone, which is something that again we talked about in that course. But um, let's quick play that groove we were doing before, just the ba 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 two or four chords or whatever you want to do. E to A minor, E to A minor. And for those wondering, we just did a film, the course, right before this on creating unique grooves, and we talked a lot about, about this in more depth, so you can check that out there. But this is a little excerpt from that. Totally. So here, I'm just emphasizing the point that you don't need to match anyone. So when I say that matching is a tool, right, it's not saying you have to do it. It's saying that it's an option, and that not matching then, therefore, is also a tool. So I'm going to play a kick drum pattern first that matches what they're doing, and then I'm going to play a kick drum pattern that completely ignores what they're doing and actually doesn't play any of the notes. So they're going to play bunk, 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 bunk. The second groove that you'll hear me switch to avoids both of those notes, but I think it works pretty well, and I think it's pretty cool. Let's do that. One, two, three, four. which has nothing to do with their rhythm. Hmm. But it works because it's repeating, so it's clearly intentional. And I'm avoiding the notes right next to what they're doing because that can sound like you're making a mistake. So yeah, got subtraction, got matching. Number three is contrast. And this is a pretty you know, broad idea here, but this is where we can call back to that first mental image we had of the web of intent. And we can, as you know, individuals or as a band together, think, okay, where are we moving on that spectrum? If what we're doing is fairly, you know, I don't want to say boring, but common or, or boring for us, sure, boring. Um, maybe one of us needs to take a step in some direction. Maybe we all need to take a step in some direction. Maybe we need to move in different directions on the same scale. So let's explore this idea a little bit. One that I have in mind here is the difference between busy and empty. Because everything being busy is just going to be a lot to handle in most cases, which isn't bad. It has its place in music. But what I, what I think is really nice, one of my favorite like, vibes, is when the drums are quite busy and the rest of the band is just playing like longer, prettier, sustained things. So let's embody that contrast between us. Right, we go different, different directions on the spectrum here um, and see what it sounds like. Ready? Same thing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> One, two, three. <laughs>
Now let's see what happens if we switch those roles. Or if, and here's a, here's a better idea. We tie in what we, what we talked about with the, with the last two, actually. So we're thinking about the different uh, frequency ranges here in the drum set. Um, what if we say high-end stuff, or sorry, high-frequency stuff, so high notes, are busy. Low-frequency stuff is simpler. Cool. Cool. Let's try it. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start simple and let them f blaze their own trail. And then I'll, I'll, I'll jump on board there. So. One, two, three, four. So clearly, Astro's focusing on higher parts. They're moving more quickly. There's active. Um, it doesn't mean it's insane, like shredding and soloing, right? It, it's a beautiful part, but he's just playing at a higher subdivision, a faster subdivision. Um, Jed's holding down a beautiful line. My kick jump's just going one, maybe something else, but mainly just one. Um, and then the, the idea that came to me that I think is worth mentioning is that adding these upbeats on the high, going to cut. Cut. Because remember, we're on a scale, sliding scale from empty to busy here. So moving toward busy doesn't mean immediately shedding chops. Right? So one step more busy on the high end of things, or like the high notes like we talked about. One step more busy is just adding some notes. So in this case, those, those upbeats, because initially in my mind I was thinking, okay, I gotta like add some crazy stuff here. But it just felt like what, what Asher came in with was so cool and needed it to just be featured, that I was like, okay, I, I should definitely stay clear of, of playing anything melodic because that's covered and that's very cool. So for me, it was just, okay, I'm just gonna add one more texture here that makes it a little bit more interesting here and it makes the, the I don't know how to word this, but the, the, inge the digestible content a little broader, right? There's one more thing to hear. Mm -hmm. Um, which just adds a little bit more interest to, to the whole equation. So yeah. yeah. Very cool. That, and these, these are all tools that you guys use actively when you're writing okay. uh, in, in the shed room or in your practice room or whatever. Definitely. And, and it's not like, it's not like we, we came together as a band and we're like, here's our set of rules that we follow and we're right. creating. Um, a lot of it becomes instinctual at a certain point. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And that's, I mean, personally why playing with Jed and Asher is so musically rewarding um, because they are listening and they are aware. And whether they, you know, whether we are thinking of like now it's time for a subtraction method or not, um, sometimes it just feels like okay, we, this needs space. Like the, right. there's too much tension built up; it needs to just dissipate now. So, right, those kinds of things are really important when when you're dealing with other musicians. Very cool. Yeah, and I still maintain that you know one of the coolest things you can do is drop out. And if, if you're in a band or you, you jam and you're thinking like, man, if I drop out, everyone's going to stop playing and like, look at me. That's pretty easily avoidable. You just go, hey, guys, like, if I stop playing, keep going before the jam, and then you're good. Right. And that could just be the coolest thing you guys do. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. so, so yeah, <laughs> we've got subtraction, contrast, matching. And the next thing I want to talk about is using less common rhythms. <laughs> now... This is a fairly, that's a pretty broad statement, like use less common rhythms, but what would be the common rhythms? I mean, that's going to be different for everyone. But all I'm really asking you to do is pay attention to what you always do and what everyone else always does. And just mm -hmm. register it as, okay, it's not good or bad. You don't have to continually play new patterns constantly. I was once obsessed with like not repeating myself. That's a, that's a depressing path to go down. Um, 
but just know what you always do and start to tune in to what your bandmates or your, your fellow musician, <laughs> your friends that you play with, what they right. always do. So that you can, so that only so that you can push yourself and them into new territory. Um, I told this story in the course that we did, but there was a, a band that I was in previously <coughs> where one member of the band brought a lot of the ideas to the table for the writing process. And then we realized at the end of a four-song EP that all the songs were within two BPM of each other. So that's a classic example <coughs> of people having habits that they're not necessarily aware of. And that's a perfect opportunity for someone like you, who's a little bit more in tune with, with those things, to say, huh, that's really cool to add some like, significant variety to this album. Why don't we slow that, those chords down, 20 BPM? And now we're in territory that we've never wrote in before. And some people will love that. Some people will be resistant to that because their chops might not work at a different tempo that, that they're not used to, but <laughs> it's just an important thing to do. So in, in the same vein, as drummers, we all have myriad habits. Uh, and when I talk about playing you know, unique rhythms, <coughs> A great example to start with is that if you ask like a hundred drummers to just play any groove, like 90 of them will play something that starts with that because it feels good to play. It's something we learn early in drums. We put that kick drum before the backbeat so we don't have to put a ghost note. There's a lot of reasons that it makes sense, but it's important to know, okay, like that's the most common rhythm in music. And like give me you know, 10 guitar players, singer-songwriter guitar players, and bring in a, a song, and they usually start with blah, duke, blah, right? Blah, duke, blah, like some rhythm of that sort, hmm. a couple dotted notes in there. <clears throat> so even just identifying that alone is huge, because you're like, okay, well, let's not play that rhythm. Let's play any other rhythm, and then we're good. And then, the other thing, I didn't want to talk about this here, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Perfect. So, well, before we go to that, so, so there's that. So be aware of what there is, what you always do, and, and try to move away from it if necessary. Um, and then there are just, I, I recently just stumbled upon this treasure trove of patterns that are all super cool, inspired by a friend of mine named Ian Barnett, who's a great drummer that everyone should check out. Um, he's really into this type of music called footwork, where there's like a lot of like... It's like really active kick work in these really odd uh, kick pattern rhythms. Um, and I, what I've realized in, in analyzing some of it is that a lot, if you just take this pattern, and permutate it on a grid, you're gonna have seven patterns that you probably have never ever played, weirdly enough and that are fairly simple to understand, but make what you're doing sound super unique. Right? So the first permutation is... The second one is... so forth, they're all pretty cool. But you can imagine if you take, you know, th the right hand of a paradiddle, just the first four notes, start shifting that, you're going to have the same phenomenon. It's going to be like, oh, these are rhythms I don't usually play. And then in line with that, I want to throw in this, this idea of extending your phrasing. So this is another, this is another one of these, like, m in my opinion, magical tips that just all of a sudden, like, you have so much more vocab than you might have realized. I want to demonstrate this point in 6-8, actually. So if I'm playing in 6-8, all I want you to try to do, next time you play drums or with a band, is don't hit one every time. It might be worth practicing a couple times before you go in with the band, but don't hit one every time, because 6-8 is one of those things that we're all like, yeah, I'm cool in 6-8, you know? And then you start playing in 6-8, and you, you know like two groups, and you just can't escape them. Mm -hmm. And what we realize is that like, uh, what, well, what I realized in listening to a lot of people do this is that it's really hard to not hit one in 6-8. Yeah. 
because we, we, we need it. We need to know where one is because it's an odd time, in my opinion. In 4-4, you don't need it. It doesn't matter. We all know where one is. But if, if, if I start playing 6-8, I can be as creative as I, as I possibly can. And if I keep hitting one, it all kind of sounds the same. Listen. do, it feels like it's just the same thing because you only have six beats to work with. If I only hit one every other beat, listen to how much it opens up the space. And then you could say, okay, if I hit one every four bars, now I have a four bar phrase. So that is just going to open up a, a whole bunch of doors for you creatively because not only will you now have more than twice as many options of melodies to play, your bandmates will have so much more space to work with. Right? Mm -hmm. It's way less limiting. Mm -hmm. Cool. I think that's all I got for that one. No, that's a great point. I, I just love being aware of what you commonly play, but also what your band also commonly plays too. Yeah. Their, their go-to licks, their go-to riffs that they do, you know, it's, it's not just you in a band situation that you gotta worry about sometimes, it's the whole band, the whole song. Yeah, yeah. And, and what's so cool, um, what you'll find as well, if you play with any musician, and playing one-on-one, -on -one, like jamming one-on-one -on -one is one of my favorite things to do because there's no limits, right? Like if, we, if there's three of us, we have to, you know, determine what the chords are and kind of like you follow each other down whatever path we're gonna go down. Um, and things have to be made a little bit more obvious so that people can catch them. But if, it, if you're one-on-one, -on -one, drums and an instrument that plays harmonies and, and melodies, then they can go anywhere they want to go at a moment's notice, right? And, and you can go or push it anywhere you want to go at a moment's notice. So, yeah, the, the, the art of, you know, reacting to people and just listening is at the, at the core of everything here. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, that's that. The next tool, which we've kind of hinted at here and there throughout this, is establishing roles and changing roles. And maybe changing roles that are, changing roles away from something that's very typical, right? The typical roles, drum set keeps the beat, plays the back beat on two and four, plays the kick drum that matches the bass. Bass plays the root notes rhythmically that match the guitar part who's playing the chords or taking a solo or something. So those are like the super standard rules. And again, they exist for a reason because when we start playing, we, we need somewhere to start. We need some kind of guidelines. But at some point in your playing, there's a point where you can start to think like, hmm, I don't know if I need to do all these things all the time. And there might be some gold just on the other side of that mountain. So let's play a little bit of Gorbis. Yeah. That's a good example. So you mean just ch establishing the roles, changing the roles up you're talking about? Changing here? the roles up, and, and sorry, yeah, let me explain. So this song, you'll hear Jed play the chords, which like, like Jed's part is very much so like what a, a piano or guitar might more typically play. Um, Asher essentially turns into a percussion instrument, and I'm playing, to call back to the tool that we just talked about playing uh, more unique rhythms, um, I'm playing some fairly unique rhythms, uh, and it's actually one of the one of the ones I was just talking about by permutating that dun 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 dun. One of the permutations is the is the root of my group. So cool. And then within the drum, we can sort of nerd out drum wise for a sec. The rolls here are usually hi hat keeps the time, like I said, snare drums two and four. Um, <clears throat> the only rule that I'm really breaking kind of hard here is that. The right hand is actually going to play a secondary melody, at least that's how I see it, uh, underneath what Jed is playing. So it will play do doom do do cat doom 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 cat doom doom on the tom. Uh, so the orchestration is weird. You're kind of keeping time on a tom, and it's rhythms that you don't usually hear. 
Uh, and it can be seen as a sub melody to the more important one, which is what Jed's playing. So, all right, let's hear it. Yeah. <clears throat> you guys think this is a yeah, just an A. Let's just hit the A. Okay. Yeah, and then yeah. uh, Jetogen 5000, that's a, <laughs> that's a good example, too. Sure. Yeah. Let's play Jed 5K. Okay. Because, again, here, um, this is a song seed that we're working on for our next album. But, um, again, uh, Jed's handling, uh, Jed's actually handling a lot here, more than bass, I guess, typically does. He's kind of handling the melody and a lot of the rhythmic uh, responsibility in the beginning, too. He's really like, in a sense, like 80% of the music going on here. And then Asher and I are really just sort of more textural layers, more than anything. Asher starts to develop a, a little bit more than that, but I'm, I'm sort of no longer playing a beat at all. I'm just a texture here. So I'm thinking like, stay out of the way, kind of, and at least maybe help it build a little bit. Um, but yeah, let's try that. Cool. If this one's in five, in case it's a little weird in the beginning. Yeah, so, I mean, that leads into other things in the song, but I mean, we can call that back to the web of intent there. And, and I'm thinking, you know, on the soft to loud scale, I'm extremely soft and only getting a little bit louder as it builds. And then I'm adding a little bit of busyness as we go here. I'm moving like this direction, right? Um, Ash was kind of doing the same thing. And Jed is really just holding it down. Um, but yeah, we've switched roles up there in a way that, that I think is... Is, is sort of fresh. I mean, it, you can't yeah. help but offer a fresh perspective if you're doing that. And um, not only just within the band switching roles, but even we talk about more in the course, which if you guys uh, will be releasing soon on Drum You Inside the Members Area, but uh, talks about this more in depth about even the role as a drummer, you know, the roles of what your hand and your bass drum and your snare should do. Uh, so it's a very cool tip. Experiment that with next time you're with a band, you know, switch up those roles. You know, that's how creative, unique songs come about. So they're not all the same, right? Amen. Cool. One more, one more tool you got. You said. Um, yeah. The last one's uh, the last one's a quick one. It's seek inspiration, and it seems a little obvious, but I think what's important to 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 mention here is that you know seeking implies making some kind of effort. 
Um, a lot of people sit and, and think that inspiration will just strike at some point. And I, you know, you've seen time and time again that you know, if you have friends sort of waiting for that to come, it really doesn't come. And if you only act in moments where you happen to be super stoked for no reason, then there's going to be few and far between the opportunities that you, that you have to create something. Um, so what you're doing when you're seeking inspiration is looking for something that lights the fire in you, right? So not waiting for it to come, but actively seeking the things that make you excited. Um, there's a little bit of, you know, the only thing I wanted to mention about this is, like, seeking inspiration doesn't mean you're copying people's ideas. Like, like there's a song in the first album of ours, the first song called Go Own Them All, that was inspired by a Zenya Rubino song that sounds nothing like what we were doing. But me and Asher were jamming that day, and he was like, man, I've been listening to this cool song, check it out. And we listened to it, and it was indeed very cool. And the next thing we played was this, was the, the seed that turned into this song. Um, and thinking back to that song, it was really like the tone, I mean, what was it about it that stuck with us? It's just like interesting rhythm, like unison line. Yeah. Um, and then like a couple displacements here and there, you know. Yeah. And just like falls to the wall rocking. Totally. You know? Totally. And and the, the, I mean, and it sticks out to me too, like the sort of tonal, like indie tone. You know what I mean? Totally. It's definitely like indie vibes of the song. And and we didn't. All we took was sort of the tone and this idea that the, that there's rhythms that were playing together and made something completely different. So. I'll also, it was you... cool to have the that in like a duo setting. Yeah. You know, because Zinner Venus is just her rocking it out on keys and the drummer. Yeah, so it's a duo as well, which was yeah, that's yeah. really relevant too. Um, I'll let you listen to the album there because we don't have that much time, so we won't play that one. But yeah, seeking inspiration is the last tool, and, and doing it actively, and, and then taking you know whatever you find super inspiring, and saying okay, what are we gonna take from this? Right. So you can't take all of it but you could take the tone, or you could take the rhythm, or you could take the harmony, or you could take whatever. You could take a piece of it and slow it down. Or it could be at a tempo that you just never play at. And you're like, oh, well, let's write something at this tempo. That's cool. It's got this high energy vibe or whatever. Um, so seeking inspiration is, is the last tool there. Love it. Tons of great tips there. And the cool thing about it is just watching you, because this is all kind of improv. A lot of the stuff, the jams you guys threw at them, you know, you can even see them talking through what chords we're going to play. Uh, so it's cool seeing just from the insider's view of you know how you guys kind of work and how these tools fit in with the band because you know one thing with what we do at drum is we teach drummers how to play the drums but you need to take that to your band and create music with that and that's why stuff like this is so valuable and you know all this stuff that, that you were just talking about it, you know even if you just take one sliver of that and just apply it to yourself as a drummer and then maybe in the, into a band setting you can go so far with it um, do you guys want to jam something out for us while, yeah, while we're talking about that? some stuff up here yeah. See if we can. Uh, this is this is not on your album. Just something you're just gonna make up, I guess. We're gonna make it up right now. So <laughs> see right. if we can practice what we preach here. Let's do it. <laughs> and again, guys, Childish Japes, the name of the band. Check out their full album. The first song that they played was on that album, and they're also gonna close out with one of those songs on their album as well. But this is just an improv jam.
Nice. Very well done, guys. Nice, yeah. Sounds Thanks. great. Maybe yeah. uh, it, it could be cool to, there was so much going through my head that I was like, oh, it'd be nice to tell them what we're thinking right now while we were doing that. Maybe yeah. we could do that. Briefly, what was yeah. going through your mind? Um, I mean, a lot of the things we talked about and then a lot of tools that I really briefly mentioned, like building tension and building suspense and then some kind of release, right? And as a drummer, one thing that I am usually conscious of and was hyper-conscious of there is committing to the instruments that you're using and letting that become the soundscape. So, like the last section, ride, kick, and snare with hi-hat keeping time. So every sound I add to that requires more CPU power for you to process, right? Which sometimes is good, but in this case, I just want to create this layer of intensity that isn't taking a whole lot of your attention, it's just making you feel a lot. So I'm committing to these instruments and just sticking with them and seeing what I can do with them. And then there was another thing that, that was worth mentioning uh, when we talked about subtracting. Um, there, there was a, I remember a part where Jed dropped out and I was quite busy and Asher was playing and then there was a moment where I knew Jed was coming in because he looked like he was coming in and when Jed came in I dropped out for just a moment right so just on one it was like and what that does is highlight the fact that he is entering right mm -hmm. so we're sort of shifting the spotlight in a sense and all these you know th there's you know an infinite number of things like that that one could consider um, and you don't have to be overly uh, cerebral about jamming I mean, it's supposed to be fun at the end of the day but the more you do it and the more you think about what works and what doesn't work the more you'll have these ideas as, as thing, th th these ideas like at the ready you know um, that are useful that's cool just just diving into your brain there while you were doing that that's, that's a a uh, really cool um, benefit for us to watch. And that sounded really cool. It sounded like you guys rehearsed that before, right? So that was really cool just to see you guys improv something that comes together like that. So do you have any last minute tips? We're almost uh, at our time here. Any last, last minute, minute tips? Um, is, it a, is it a choice between one more song and tips, or can we do both? No, we're doing both. All right, well, the quick tips. Quick tips. The last things I wanted to tell people, if you're jamming, if you're playing with people, don't be afraid to make big changes. Just go ahead and change the time signature and the tempo and, the, and just stop playing. You know, do some crazy stuff. Um, because there's a real tendency in jam system to kind of go, uh, and kind of peter out. Mm -hmm. So it's okay to do that. The next thing, um, avoid lame grooves. I know that's extremely general, but avoid the grooves you always play. Try to get creative. Try to break the rules. Um, avoid, you don't have to avoid this, but if you're trying to write with a band, uh, maybe avoid like 10 minute guitar solos, right? Because that's not typically a productive <laughs> part of the writing session. People just get stuck in a groove and someone starts soloing and they're like, well, I, I guess we're soloing now, right? So you don't have to do that. Um, another thing is end the jam, right? There's so many times in my life where the, like, all the good ideas were right at the beginning. It was a really cool thing and it built up and it was perfect and it was ready to be done. And then like 10 minutes later, we're still playing kind of like BS stuff that, you know, we thought might be cool or we're just kind of out of ideas, but no one's like got any conviction to end it. End it when it's meant to end. You can just stop playing and be like, go, that was cool. <laughs> uh, and the last thing is, which was an idea that Asher brought to my attention a while ago when we were writing, was to try to improvise a song and try to consciously, you know, play an A section, change it to a B section, remember what the A section was and go back to it and have some kind of song form and then at, you know, at the end of you know, a two or three minute song, end it and you'd be surprised at how good you are writing songs when you do that. I think that's all I got. Anything else? Um, one kind of general thing to always think about and you touched on it a little bit with the contrast but uh, a great teacher of mine once said um, you know, always think about, you know, what you're creating the need for. Mm. Like if you're doing one thing for a super long time, that creates the need to do the opposite of it, right? Mm. So that's always a directional thing that you can do. Create the contrast within your own part um, and also like think, you know, as a producer, which I do a little bit of as well, like try to think about the bigger picture and, you know, if this one vibe has been happening, washy, let's say, 
then try to do tight <laughs> afterwards. You know, create yeah. that contrast. You know, bold moves when yeah. you're improvising. It's the same thing. Yeah. So. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, guys. This is great. Just hearing you guys play and hearing your insights and your Asher as well. And Jed, you're playing on the bass. is great. He was in here jamming before we were live on the drum kit, and he's a killer drummer, too. In fact, you guys are all great drummers, you know? Um, <laughs> so you can play, man. Yeah. You can play. <laughs> yeah. All Berkeley students. I guess that explains it, right? At Berkeley, you learn <laughs> drums. Everyone learns drums. Wow. Start with drums, and you're good. <laughs> um, anyway, thank you so much. Uh, you guys, if you're watching this live, um, we're trying to heavily get more into the musical side of lessons. You know, we do so many lessons on paradiddles and technique and all that kind of stuff. But we're trying to bridge that gap with music. And uh, we have two sister sites, I guess you can call them sister sites. We have piano.com, which is all about piano, and guitarlessons.com, also known as Guitario. Uh, both of those are very similar to what we do in Dromeo, but they share so many similarities. And um, so I'm glad you guys can come in here and share this on Dromeo. And if you guys are guitarists or you know any guitarist friends, in one hour from now, if you're watching live on guitarlessons.com, our YouTube page, Asher is gonna be live with the band Childish Japes, and they're gonna do a whole live stream with a, a lesson on chords, I believe. Yeah, and a little bit of composition as well. Chords and composition, which is gonna be awesome. Uh, and if you guys are Drumio members here and you're watching this in the archives or you're watching this on YouTube and you guys have guitarist friends and stuff, make sure you check that out. It will be on YouTube eventually, but we have a whole website just like Drumio for guitarists and uh, featuring Asher and Childish Japes. Anything else to add? Anything that I'm missing before we wrap up here, guys? I think that's it. Yeah? Cool. What was the first song you guys played and opened with, just so we all know? What did we play in the beginning? Uh, Seed 73. That's, yeah. yeah, that's not a song Working yet. Title. Oh, that's, that's not on the album. That's no, not on not the album. album. Oh, so you got a sneak peek of something coming up. Yeah, that'll probably be really on played. the second album. Very cool. Yeah. Very cool. Well, be sure to follow Childish Japes online. Make sure you follow J.P. Bouvet. And I forgot to mention this, but J.P. Bouvet has made quite a name for himself. He won the Guitar Center Drum Off in 2011. Amazing, amazing video. Check that out. You also play with some heavy hitters. Um, let me just refresh my uh, uh, memory <laughs> on the name. Um, uh, sorry, Steve Vai, Zach Wild, and Tosin Abasi from Generation X. Yeah. You're playing with them quite regularly, on tour with them all the time. So you've gone quite a long way, and I've been following you for a long time. Uh, so it's, a, it's an honor to have you out here. I appreciate that. Awesome. Okay, so I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to leave, and I'm going to get you guys to play one more song. What is this song called? I uh, came up with it yesterday. <laughs> yeah. so oh, this is know. not on the album either. <laughs> oh, no. man. We're, we're kind of like really committed to the creative process. So whenever we can be playing new things and creating new things, that's what we're trying to do. Put your money where your mouth is. Yeah. Great. I love it. I love it. Well, we're going to hear them jam one more tune. And uh, if you guys are watching online, check us out at drumio.com. Sign up. We have a whole course that dives into this in the, from more of a drummer's perspective on creating unique grooves. Uh, it's really cool. And with that being said, play us out. <laughs>